back everybody um uh, we had a really good time uh the previous session um uh, we are really privileged to have uh, a very seasoned speaker a seasoned researcher um professor gordon wismere uh gordon uh, who's the Kuhn professional chair in logistics at the universidad de los andes in bogota colombia from 2011-2007 he worked as economic affairs officer in the Contractor Service Unit at the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Previously, he worked at Edinburgh Napier University Transport Research Institute and as consultant for UN ECLAC, UNTAG, UN OHRLS, the World Bank, Delphi Research, JICA, and a whole lot. He's an internationally recognized expert in geography of maritime transport economics, port economics, and inland shipping issues with particular interest in shipping networks, governance competition, transport costs, sustainability, and energy efficiency. So help me welcome uh, Professor God Wismere to take the podium. Gordon, so you can share your screen. Okay, Mawuli, um, th thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, thanks a lot also for the invitation. Um, a pleasure to, to connect um, from, from South America, um, really to, to be here with you, to, to share some, some thoughts uh, from, from current research that we're doing. And um, looking also forward um, for ideas um, and comments and, and discussions um, on the issue. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, the, so the, the next 15 minutes, um, and Mabuli will probably help me with the timing, um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about some research we're currently doing with, with Jason um, Monius on reflecting on the trade of low-valued goods and the potential of degrowth. Um, so the question here is, okay, wh why are we doing this? Uh, what is the motivation um, for this research? And um, if we start <coughs> with a um, citation, it's on the current state of climate, and is, it is worse, much worse than you think, um, as David Wallace Wells um, said in 2019. And I guess um, with the news that reached us today from Canada with the heat waves um, and also in the west of the US, um, the, the signals we're receiving from our planet um, that the state of our Earth is not very good um, are uh, accelerating. So um, there is a really urgent need um, to act. Um, and I think... Um, here, in, particularly in this group, the issue of time and action is, is really crucial to that. So, so what, what we found when we think about um, the, the problem that we are facing is actually that when, when we look at what has happened in maritime trade over, over the last years, basically since the year 2000, which you take as a, a reference here, and we look at um, very simple indicators, actually. We look at the carbon intensity, uh, the goods loaded, the ton miles, and the TO2 emissions that have been produced by maritime transport, <clears throat> and take uh, this as an index. We actually find that, well, there has been... Um, advances in terms of um, uh, environmental and technological efficiency, as we can see by, by the yellow line here, which depict uh, has been an improving in the carbon intensity related to the good transported. But the big challenge that we see is despite these efficiency gains, <laughs> right, um, we have an increase of the overall CO2 emissions of the sector. So, um, this leads us a little bit to this um, conclusion that maritime trade continues to outgrow environment and technological efficiency. So uh, a lot of efforts that we're doing that are very good, that are interesting about changing technology seem to be too slow. So, so the question here is, okay, what other measures are there um, that we can take or what other issues should we address um, in order to, to rectify the situation. And um, one question that comes here to our mind or, or that came to our mind um, in, in, in this research is, okay, um, can we actually afford maritime transport to grow further? So, so this, this brings us to the hypothesis we're working on. And then 
that part of the solution toward reaching the COP21 goals is, is not in how maritime transport operates, but also rather what is being transported. So this comes to this question, okay, the things that are, we are transporting, does it make sense to transport them or should we rather not transport them? It brings us back to a very um, well old discussion in, in, in the transport ecology was about the first issue should be avoiding transport, not generating transport. And so, so here's the question, okay, what are we actually transporting? Uh, how, what does our trade look like? Um, does the trade, uh, the products we are transporting, do they bring economic value? And then the question comes back from that, and which is very um, timely with the recent rates and freight um, <clears throat> rates, is if low transport costs actually facilitate the transfer of non-value adding products. And uh, we'll, we'll give some examples of that. And the other question is, if we talk about the global logistics chains, fragmentation of logistics chains, the great efficiency that has been gained by doing so. But the other question and hypothesis that, that um, is, is driving our mind here is, do low transport costs and other measures actually facilitate unsustainable fragmentation of supply chain? So we, we know that the division of labor, right, has been one of uh, efficient, um, uh, very successful model. Uh, but generating more transport um, overall. We have seen a little uh, reversing of that, um, of this um, global extension of supply chains or product supply chains, but there's still a lot of more transport happening to pro pro produce one product. And clearly we have another challenge, which is the continued absence of internalizing external costs in transport in general. So um, here we come also to the conclusion that possibly transport is too cheap. Now, with this, we then have to go to the definition of degrowth. <clears throat> and degrowth is not a new thing. And we can go back to the 70s and, and publication from Georgesco Rogan on the entropy law and the economic process or the Club of Rome with the publication on the limits to growth. Um, so, so there's th this question that, that comes back, okay, how would we then define degrowth? Because degrowth not necessarily means um, a lesser quality, right? Um, it, it rather is a question, a different type of growth. And um, degrowth has been actually been part of, of the discussion in relationship to sustainability, um, because there, there is a notion that um, the economic expansion <coughs> of um, um, our activities has been typically been the fossil fuel driven. So, so there is a significant a need maybe to uh, go, uh, well, go away from that model and um, look for not fossil fuel driven economic development. Now, <clears throat> what does that possibly mean for shipping and ports? That would probably mean less volume, greater quality. Um, which I guess if we ask the sector and the private actors in the sector is a huge challenge. <clears throat> because if we ask a port, okay, how would your operating model look like if you were actually look into decreasing your port throughput in the future? Would you still be have a property model? Um, how would um, a shipping line react if you say you should actually transport less? Um, how um, can you make this um, a, a model of your business successful with transporting less, but with greater quality. So here we probably talk about reducing quantity, right? Not necessarily value of this, this maritime trade. <clears throat> so, so if we take then the reflection on, on transport cost in general, I mentioned that um, in, in the beginning, um, that transport cost may be uh, too cheap. And, and we can go here that to Kindleberger in, in the 1970s, where we argue that trade is stimulated by the difference of price structures, right, between two countries do not eat up um, by the cost to connect um, these trading partners. <clears throat> so here we need a technical bridging where we have a very um, efficient system at we see, which has been uh, reducing its carbon intensity. And we have this economic bridging uh, of space by scheme of adequate pricing. Now, now the question here is what is adequate pricing? So what is the level of transport cost for adequate technical transport services that makes the bridging of spaces become sustainable? 
Now, this is a very different question um, to asking this in, to ask where we have a price that makes um, prices um, a, a reality in, in the current economic situation, right? In the, in the current model of competition. We can also see if we take just an example of the container freight rates, the CCFI between 2005 and May 2021, that only um, in 2021 we basically kind of recovered freight rates um, that we had before the financial crisis. Um, so, so this is um, so we have living been living um, a period, a decade, or, or well over a decade actually, um, of very very low um, freight rates. And we have been getting used to that. And that has been um, probably motivating transport of goods that otherwise would have not been transported. And we can see that now with the increase in freight rates. Because we, when, we when you talk with the sector, you find discussions, well, actually, now it's not possible to transport this product anymore because the freight rates are too high. And then the question is, why did we transport them in the first place if they are not really probably adding a good level of um, economic value to, to the development of society. <clears throat> so, so here, some examples. I'm, I'm going to just show, show a few because of the time. Um, because how do we, where do we have a quantitative degrowth potential in shipping? Well, we have fossil fuels. Uh, I'll, I'll mention weight loss and, and the waste and plastic product. I'm, I'm just going to very briefly give you some examples of that. Um, for example, if, if we think and take um, the, 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 the review of maritime transport with its um, statistics, we have to realize that 30% of global maritime trade are petroleum products, and 11% is coal. Now, this means if we really are serious from deconnecting from a fuel-driven economic growth, in the best case, this could disappear. Um, I know this is maybe pr pr quite controversial, <laughs> what we're saying here, but if we uh, really get to a decoupling or, for example, transport from fossil fuels, we would have a significant reduction potential in maritime transport. And this is maybe good news because this would actually bring us uh, closer to that reduction of CO2 emissions and, and would be a, a, a good consequence. <clears throat> So, so here, um, one, one growth potential, which is probably low-hanging fruit, if we, for example, take this transformation uh, or the technological transformation forward towards electromobility or, or other fuels, um, right? And if these fuels are then produced locally. The, the second example is about um, going back to Weber uh, and the location theory, where he talks about um, weight loss materials or, or weight gaining materials, for example, juice and, juice and soaps. Now here, um, we have the example of weight loss materials. If, if we look at the trade, for example, of copper ores, right? <clears throat> where we have about um, 52.9 million tons according to, to Uncom trade. And we know when we convert these iron ore into, um, from raw material into a manufactured product, uh, some, some tools, for example, right? We have about a loss of 40% of the weight. Now, if we were not going to transport iron ore, but we would rather transport um, and convert this iron ore into more manufactured product closer to the location where it is found, you have a theoretical potential of reducing that transport volume by 40%. <clears throat> if, if we think, thinking that vessels that we have usually in Latin America that move copper ore about 25 to 40,000 dead weight tons, um, um, we are talking about an equivalent of 792 vessel voyages of 40,000 dead weight tons, vessels, right? So, so Again, he has a potential, but it requires significant rethinking um, of what we want to do. And, and other things when we talk about the weight gaining materials, <clears throat> for example, why do we ship things like liquid soap? Or why do we ship things like juice? Um, because actually, a lot of times, 90% or more of these products is actually water. And so we are shipping uh, liquid or water around what we could, for example, choose um, change from liquid soap to solid soap, and that would reduce also um, the, the, the products that, that have been transported. So these are some, 
some things, um, well, theoretical games we're playing here on, on, on finding this potential that goes beyond what is usually discussed. <clears throat> We have a, a similar like, question then when we talk about low value materials. Um, and here we have um, some, some commodities um, taken from trade statistics. And um, it's quite interesting when you look at, for example, of the value, uh, average value per ton of some of these products. For example, um, if, if we look at um, glass waste, right? Glass waste, right? It's 0 0.00011 US dollars per ton. It's the value of that product being traded. Is, is that worthwhile? Um, is that a necessary trade flow? Um, so, and we can we can play that with different products, right? We can take that, for example, also with, with waste paper, um, uh, scrap, for example, um, or, uh, plastics um, waste, right? So we see very, very low values. And is this shipping really necessary? Um, is, is this shipping a type or this shipping, this type of product, is it sustainable? Um, or, or the shipping of, of things like uh, municipal waste, um, right? Um, does it make sense to ship waste around and be charging for that? And then in other places uh, incinerate it or even dump it into the sea? like we see many cases so so a significant question here because um we, we can see there are relatively significant volumes of, of these products being shipped so um how do we deal with that right um and maybe what what could be measures that this is not being shipped anymore and it probably goes far far beyond this discussion uh, beyond the uh, shipping uh, sector so so the emerging question here is so um what are the possible models for shipping for the shipping and port sector in a degrowth scenario? And um, how can we create the shift to a quality driven shipping sector? So, and what are quality drivers in economies uh, which are strongly driven by scale? And maybe should we think about regulating um, transport prices? maybe minimum prices or minimum values um, of, of price that can be shipped. And one question that came to our mind, which goes a little bit beyond that, because the question here is if you have low transport costs and facility, rather strengthen the dependency of the global south and lateral development, and actually led to an unsustainable division of labor and fragmentation of production. So maybe here we have a wrong interpretation of the traditional endowment factors and their use and using them to a certain advantage. So, so what I would like to show here, this is uh, stimulate the discussion um, where we might have to ask more critical questions. So it's nice to talk about growth in maritime trade. It's nice to see higher freight rates, but the question is, okay, how does this development really contribute to the goals we have in creating a more sustainable future for our planet? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gordon. Uh, that was an insightful uh, presentation. Uh, we will now take questions. If you do have questions, please you can raise up your hands or you can type it in the chat box. Is there any questions? Okay, uh, Professor Gaval. Yes, good morning. Hello, I know it's morning still for Gordon and everyone on but this well. side of, yeah. On this side of the hemisphere. Uh, very interesting presentation, very thought provoking. Um, I wish we had more time for lots of other, you know, discussions and implications of some of the points you have raised. But uh, I guess my question for you is, um, when you say, when you presented the table with the value per ton, and uh, you know, kind of like questioning if it's worth right transporting those those goods for that amount of value, for that very little value. Um, have you given any thoughts or how to assess the whole business model of those products? Because I guess what's going on in my mind right now is that if someone is shipping this, it's because somebody is selling, and if there's somebody selling, it's because somebody is buying, <laughs> right? The whole thing it's like obviously somebody is making money out of this yeah. right even if you see the several zeros after after the comma 
And so how we could have, I guess the word I'm thinking right now is a more holistic approach of the whole cycle, not just, uh, let's say, if you look at the value, then you'll be obviously questioning it very, very fiercely, right? What are we doing here? What are we, why are we doing this? So uh, I don't know. It's, it's more like a, a reflection and you know, interjection type of comment. <laughs> No, Cassie, I think yeah, what, what we are finding is, um, as I said, this is ongoing research where we've been trying to, to, to really understand what is happening. But it's kind of worrying when you see, when you look at, start to look at the statistics and to actually look what is actually in these containers, right? Because mm -hmm. we always like, oh, wow, this great value is being shipped. And this is true. There are the very high valued products, um, substantial supply chain products be, being shipped. But there's a significant part, which is basically just scrap that and waste that is being shipped. And the question mm -hmm. is, um, has this been bloated up artificially by low transport costs? Now, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a very difficult discussion, I have to admit, because one could argue, okay, because in, 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 in the 90s, we said, well, high transport costs create barriers to trade. Mm -hmm. True. But maybe they also, to a certain extent, protected us that we were actually shipping waste or scrap or unworthy material. Because then people said, well, before I ship it, I probably rather do another process with this product in my vicinity. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and it's very controversial, I think. And it, was, <laughs> you know, but. it is, it is. And it, this, this just reminds me of a, a case of a major shipping line. I'm not going to tell, say their name to so don't embarrass anyone. But I was working still the, for another competitor shipping line uh, mm -hmm. when this came about on the media. And they were basically sending, uh, you know, domestic trash waste uh, from the UK to Brazil. Mm -hmm. And when the and the inspectors caught this, because obviously there was a little bit of a weirdo description in the bill of lading <laughs> of that a commodity was, and they opened the container and, the, and there was you know baby diapers, you know use it of course once <laughs> everything mm -hmm. trash horrible things you can imagine. So and then of course uh, it became a problem for certain container liners and they became more selective, like you're saying, in what to transport. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then it, it was a, a little bit of an overlap between the company policy, like the private business, right? If somebody's paying the, for this freight, I don't care what they put in this container, right? And say, wait mm -hmm. a minute, you should care because there is a regulation in place to where you're moving this thing, right? So. It was, uh, I think the ca the case kind of died off, but uh, in the media, like, you know, but eventually it became a, a restriction. So when a, an inquiry will come from a customer saying, oh, it's just a scrap or it's just, a, you know, whatever waste type of thing, mm -hmm. the, the liner shipping or the, the management will immediately reject the, the cargo and say, we are not interested in this business, right? Because they didn't, but th then you see what happens. They were not interested in the business because it was a bad thing to ship waste from A to B. It was a bad thing to have their containers with their logo shipping waste. <laughs> mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was a more like a marketing problem rather than the actual problem. You're shipping, you know, use it, baby diapers, come on, you know. So it's uh, uh, a very interesting case. So yeah, anyways, I, I just wanted to, to, yeah, to it, see if no, it's, but, but it's ongoing. It's ongoing. It, it, so. Yeah, it's, it's ongoing. But, but so, so I think you, you, we have found s several examples of that. Also, when you look at trade from the US to China, mm -hmm. a lot of that trade is scrap metal, hay, straw, you know? Yeah. And then, then you, you see the right, ask the question, okay, why? Okay. Then we said, oh, but it's more efficient because we have imbalances of trade. All right. We have empty containers that need to be repositioning. Right. Yes. That is also true, but but so, so but what on the on the way out you ship I don't know maybe plastic spoons right so yeah. so we're shipping hay because we so so actually we're finding a lot more questions than answers uh, right now mm -hmm. but but starting to drill down okay what is actually being shipped what is actually in these containers what is actually the value of that what's being shipped right and and it comes back to this um, also the supply chain perspective. Um, we have been able to fragmentate so much because of low transport costs, and that has been celebrated. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. The, the question is then, has this fragmentation gone too far? Right. Okay. Too many intermediaries, so, yes. Mm-hmm. Sure. Sorry, I, I know sorry. it's a very, it's a very provoking topic. Yes, yeah, that yes, was, yes. That's Thank really you. Way interesting. I'm, I'm sure if we leave you, like, we can discuss this on and on and on. Uh, <laughs> but thank you very much, uh, Gordon and uh, Cassia, for thank that you, question. Man. Thank you, Cassia. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll go next to the... We'll go to the next speaker. The next speaker is one of the founders of CAPTIA. Uh, he's Dr. Roosevelt Panahi, and uh, he's also a founder of Zucalo Canada. Uh, Roosevelt is actually a risk management expert uh, with over 10 years experience in multidisciplinary plans and projects in collaboration with a broad range of stakeholders. Um, actually, he has uh, disseminated risk management knowledge through scholarly and professional outlets in close collaboration with practitioners and researchers. He's founding member of CAPTIA, which I've, I've already told you about, and an advisor to the Climate Bond Initiative, which uh, Rusbe and I worked on together. So Rusbe, uh, you have the floor to present uh, your findings. And Rusbe, I want to say personally, hello, nice to see you again. Hi, hi, hi. long time, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mavoli, for, for the introduction and uh, it's a great honor for me to be here today. So I'm going to share my screen. Is it okay now? Can, can, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Ruzbe and I'm, today I'm going to talk about our recent research uh, on, in the area of resilience assessment. Uh, I have had the privilege to work with Negar, Joseph, and Adolf. In the research. This year as a, I'm here as a representative of the, this group of hardworking co-workers and colleagues. So uh, the title of the, the, the research is about uh, developing the resilience assessment model for complex systems. And in this case, we are focusing on uh, the port industry in face of COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm sure that you know a lot about the ports and its importance in, in, our, in, in, in our world. So, and you have heard about the, the effect of COVID-19 on, on the port industry. So let's jump on to the main question of the, this research. We wanted to know uh, how is it possible to measure the resilience of the port uh, in face of the pandemic outbreak and how can we quantify it? And, the second question of our research was to, to understand what could be done to improve the resilience of the, the port industry and what are the options and what are the priorities. And in order to do so, we, we needed to dive into to, to the literature and of course we needed to uh, uh, address three main questions. And let's say that we had an experience with, uh, with using Bayesian belief network which is a good uh, tool in, in designing resilience assessment models. So we needed to address three main questions. The first one was about understanding the main components of resilience. And the second one was about what has been done in the port industry in terms of the resilience. And the third one was of course about the application of Bayesian belief network in understanding and measuring the resilience. So for the resilience and its elements, uh, you, you, you may know that the idea of resilience comes from the human behavior and psychology. So with that said, there are a lot of different definitions for, for the term of, for, for the resilience. And, and so it's been evolved over time. No matter what, understanding the resilience of the system and, uh, and taking a resilience-based approach towards complex systems would give us a chance to, to take better decisions and educated decisions by understanding the, the state of our system and the way it should go and what could be done to improve it. So in our, in, in, in our study, we, we, too, we, we built our research based on a definition provided by NRC in 12, 2012, which, which talks about the resilience as, the, as plan and prepare for, absorb, recover from, and adapt to actual or possible disruptions. In this definition, we have actually three, three components. The first one is about planning and preparing for the situation. And our research is, can help 
in this area of planning and preparing for the for this situation. And there are also absorb absorption, restoration, and adaptation, which are which we call them from now on resilience building capacities. And at last, it, there is a there is a disruption, and in this case, you are talking about COVID nineteen, and you can imagine that we can add any other disruptions and uh, like those happening as a result of climate change. So for the for the resilience uh, measurements uh, in the context of port industry, uh, many tools has been used over time, and and I, I'm just presenting a couple of methods that's been used in this area, starting from the very basic definition of the risk. There have been a lot of lot of research in in doing in measuring the resilience of the of of the ports. And you can see other methods and tools and techniques like DTA, FMEA, and of course, Spice and Belief Network, and not to mention those researchers are different in, in the scope, the kind of data that, that they are using. Is it, it's, it could be quantitative data, qualitative data, or a combination of the both. And they have used different tools to, to, to approach the, the, the problem. So we have had a good, uh, literature to, to build our research. And of course, about the Bison Belief Network, to give you a, a brief understanding or a brief introduction to, to, to Bison Belief Network, it's based on, on the bias term, and I, I'm going to talk about it a little bit in, in future slides and then in the next few slides. So it gives you the, the, the ability to, to capture, to, to model and to model uncertain situations and uh, it's been used uh, in different fields like risk analysis, reliability engineering, and of course in resilience assessment. And it's been widely used over the, the past 10 years by different researchers. They've done a lot in this area. So, so we needed to understand what's been done, what are the, the pros and cons of those researchers and build our research based on those understand and build based on the understanding. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about the theoretical, theoretical basis of the, our research. As I said before, we needed to have a good definition of the resilience. And, I, and, and as I said before, we have a lot of different definitions in this area. In our, in our research, we took the definition which, uh, which, which with, with three main resilience building capacities. And here you can see that there is a there is a system with with uh, a performance, and all of a sudden an unexpected event happens and its performance drops to a certain level, and after that it goes back to to a new situation. And in in this case, uh, capacities of the pores are of the system defines uh, the, the 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 peaks and and the, and the drop and. The, the curve and the shape of the, the uh, our return to the normal situation, which could be even lower than previous performance of our system or, or higher than, than our previous performance. And here we define resilience as the relation and the ratio between uh, rest, re restored performance and lost performance. So we are going to measure RP and LP in our, in our research. And uh, to give you an idea about the Bayesian belief network, as you can see here, you can imagine that in our everyday, we have we are experiencing events uh, around us, and some of them are related to other 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 events, and some of them are caused by other events. And so, what Vivian can give us is to 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 map these these events around us. And this is the main idea behind using Bayesian belief network. And in our research, we, we try to, to map the compl complex system like a port and connect nodes and understand causal relations. And uh, at the end of the day, measure the resilience of the system. But here is, an, and here is a mathematical question, equation behind a simple Bayesian uh, belief network model. Here you have, you know, parent nodes and child nodes, and together we have a main equation governing the system. So it's joint probability of the 
of events from X1 to X6, which is equal to, to prior probability of a couple of nodes and posterior probability of other nodes, which are called child nodes in our case with parents. Based on that, our, our model was something like this in the, at the, in the beginning, and we tried to add to the resolution of this model. So we have resilience, which is connect, uh, and we have lost performance and recovered performance connected to the resilience. And each of those nodes are, are, um, are supported or there are, there are nodes that contribute to, to those, those top nodes. Uh, so, uh, in order to do so, we needed to take uh, four steps, uh, starting from identifying components of the resilience, including disruptions and three aforementioned capacities, resilience building capacities, together with with uh, after that we needed to we needed to to build the causal relation understand the causal relation and build the model and after that we needed to quantify the model and finally assess the resilience of the system by applying different uh, different approaches uh, different techniques uh, so this is this is what happened at the end of the day by by um doing all affirmation steps i know that you would have some difficulties in reading the, the notes uh, but you know i just wanted to give you an idea of what would happen at the end of the day you have a dashboard which uh, and that you can use as a decision maker or uh, someone who wants to know what's the the the, the, the state of the system and considering uh, all the actions and all the disruptions and uh, as you can see here, there are some nodes uh, which we which we quantified them based on historic data of the of the port under study. In this case, it was a container terminal in a, in a Hong Kong port, and there are other nodes which are quantified which are quantified based on based on some based on surveys and and interviews. Uh, so. At the end of the day, we have a resilience here. And in this case, the resilience of the port was something like 83%, which means that you know the, the ratio between lost capacity and uh, rest, restore capacity to lost capacity is something like 83% in, in the port under study, considering all the restrictions and our inputs and so on and forth, so forth. Uh, we also had absorption node, disruption node, and adaptation transformation node and recovery nodes as four parts of the resilience definition, which contribute to, to, to measuring the resilience of the system. After quantifying this model and measuring the total resilience of the system, we could, we could apply uh, different methods to, to, to understand more about the, the situation one of them is, is sensitivity analysis. With sensitivity analysis, we can identify uh, the parent nodes with, with the highest contribution to the child nodes. And let's let's focus on, on this absorption node with a couple of parent nodes connected to it because we want to know what we can do as a port authority to, to, to increase and enhance the absorptive capacity of our port. When I'm talking about the absorptive capacity, it's about built-in capacities inside the port. You, you, I mean, you have you have some some things in place, and all of a sudden an event happens, and how your system can can respond to 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 that to that event to to that event without spending more money. It's all about absorption. So with absorption, we, we understood that with, with analyzing the system and doing the sensitivity analysis, we found that port connectivity, in case of the port we, 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 we measured when we, we, we investigated, was the, was the main and was the most important uh, measure in place uh, that helped the port to, to maintain its resilience. And the cyber infra infrastructure was the second, second most important a feature of the port, and you can you can do this tornado graph for for all the nodes and all the uh, and all the connections to understand what 
was the most important things and uh, what are the possibilities? What are the, the potentials for, for improving your system? For example, uh, in, uh, in, in the portal under study, we, um, we found that, you know, the electronic exchange platform uh, was the, the fifth, uh, was the sixth uh, elements com contributor to, to, the, to the absorptive capacity of the, the port under study. So it gives you an idea of if you can do better in, in this area and what you can do in this area. And, and you, can, you can do the same for, for all the other nodes. And there is another analysis which, which we can which we do, especially when we are talking about the future. And uh, it's it's about scenario analysis. You can you can build different scenarios and apply it to to your model and to find out okay if we we just going to be disconnected with other ports, what would happen for the resilience of our system, for example. Uh, or if we, we invest more on the training of our our port uh, in, in our in the training of uh, in in our port, what would happen and what would be the outcome of the, the spending more money on on the training? And that's what we can do with scenario analysis and understand the contribution of different nodes contributing to to to, to, to the total resilience of the system. Uh, so, uh, as, as we discussed, we, we can apply uh, BBN successfully in measuring the resilience of our system. Uh, and the case of pandemic outbreak was a good example of, you know, applying our understanding of, uh, of resilience and a tool like BBN. And in, in the case of our study, in under study, we, we found that port connectivity training and service versatility would play a critical role in building resilience of the port. Uh, with port connectivity, it was about, uh, it was the main element of absorptive capacity. Training was the main element of restorative capacity, those capacities that we have to spend time and money on it. And with service versatility, it's a long-term uh, Capacity which we have to work on as a port in a port industry, uh, which is among um, adaptive or transformative uh, capacities that we, we talked about, and of course uh, the model can be strengthened with with benefiting from more qualitative data, adding uh, to the resolution of the system or adding to the stage of those nodes as you as you as you, as I just presented to you. For most of the nodes, it was true or false conditions. So we can we can add to those conditions to to be able to to enhance our model, and and the and but the main thing is to 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 remember that all those enhancement comes at the cost. So there should be a balance between the the cost and what we are going to do and what we are we are achieving. So thank you everyone for for. Uh, for giving me the chance to be here. And I want to thank you from, from the CAPTIO members who just, you know, helped me to be here. Adolf, Mavali, Changmin, Travis, and Jason. And thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Roosevelt. That was an interesting presentation, the application of BN uh, to actually solve the problem of resilience. I have one quick question, uh, Roosevelt. Uh, mm -hmm. When you were presenting um, on the node, there is this node desired performance. Uh, can you throw a little bit more light on what it is, uh, what it represents, and how you actually got the data for for the input to that particular node? Uh, what, about the performance, about the, the loss performance, uh, there are there are three there are three uh, nodes connected to, to 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 the performance of to 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 connected to the loss performance. And one of them was the actual performance of the port. So we had a time history of events happening inside the port as well as, you know, occupancy of the port and things like that. So we had a time history and we drew it in a spectrum based on historical data. And the other two nodes contributing to the loss performance was disruption and, and uh, of course, absorptive capacity of the port. And there was a, a simple, mathematical equation behind combining the three to, to, to measure the loss performance of the port. 
thank you very much. Uh, do we have any other question? We we'll allow one more question and then we we'll move on to the next presenter. Uh, if you have a question, you can raise up your hand or you can type it in the chat box. I can't see anybody. So if that's the case, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roosevelt. And uh, uh, we, we welcome the next presenter. So the next presenter is uh, Mr. Chum Entry Ejakwa. He is actually a PhD student at the University of Cape Coast in the Integrated Coastal Zone uh, Management uh, at the Africa Center of Excellence in Coastal Resilience. Um, his research interest is GIS and remote sensing applications in environmental change. Currently, he's working to develop a decision supporting system to assess coastal vulnerability to aid in building resilience. So it looks like um, the groundwork for resilience is what uh, Mr. Chum would like to present. So Mr. Chum, uh, you are welcome and uh, the floor is yours. So you can share your screen. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, th thank you very much um, for the invitation and also the opportunity to be part of this event. Um, uh, it has been a learning process. Uh, I've learned a lot. And uh, I think that the, the past or the immediate presenter has actually presented um, something um, about the Bayesian network, um, which um, I'm, I'm actually trying to use to um, uh, um, develop the decision tree. Um, my presentation this um, here, here we're almost in the evening um, from Ghana, um, is um, shoreline change prediction using the Bayesian network. Um, uh, this is uh, actually a project uh, myself and uh, my my roommates, yeah, which is Emmanuel Brimpong, uh, which, which is in the oceanography department. Um, we, are, we are working along the same the same direction. Yeah, uh, this is going to be how my presentation is going to be like the outline of my presentation. Uh, basically, uh, sea rise um, globally has, has, has increased um, uh, between 21 to 24 uh, centimeters since the uh, 1880. And um, uh, we need to understand that um, this uh, majority of this rise um, actually happened within the past two, two and a half decades. Um, the increase in this, um, or the increase in sea level rise actually is, um, has also reached the frequency of uh, potential um, storms and also extreme uh, weather conditions along the coast. And this, this have created a coastal in instability which is a major concern for the um, integrated coastal managers and planners um, along the coast, because um, uh, it's estimated that about 40% of uh, the global population, which is estimated to be around 2.4 billion, resides within 100 kilometers, that's around 60 miles um, uh, from the coast. And of, of this, about 10% actually resides less than 10 meters uh, above sea level. Yeah, so in actual fact, if the sea continues to increase, this population is actually at, at risk. Now, the result of this uh, um, climatic conditions or this sea level rise actually introduce um, potential hazards as I already indicated. Yeah. <clears throat> now, the results of, of this um, extreme conditions actually it um, brings about coastal erosions, um, coastal flooding, and also increasing or increasing salinity of uh, estuaries and uh, aquifers, which um, um, my, my, my study area or Ghana is, is, is not left out. Yeah. Now, um, these conditions or these hazards are compounded uh, by certain factors. Um, notably among them is the social factor uh, because the coastal area is very productive. Yeah, um, the, 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 uh, it provides certain ecosystem services such as recreation as a tourist attraction, also provide transportation, 
also very rich in bio biodiversity and also provide food and raw materials. A lot of people continue to also reside in the, in the coastal areas. Um, it's estimated that uh, Ghana, especially, we have almost 80% of our uh, industries located at the coast. So uh, it, it actually creates room for uh, people to migrate down south and also look for job opportunities. Now we also have uh, natural factors like the low um, elevation um, also compounds the, 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 the hazards. And also we have the anthropogenic uh, factors like the poor planning and also the conversion of um, uh, land cover, which in, in natural fact um, uh, changes the uh, authors, the coastal uh, geomorphology. Now, this, these factors um, um, actually um, uh, exacerbate the, the effects, um, especially when the hazards occur in terms of uh, damage to properties, and also loss of loss in economic uh, gains, and also uh, ultimately uh, loss of life. Yeah, um, Ghana is actually experiencing um, a reoccurring disasters in recent times, even currently. We are, we are battling with um, urban flooding in our two most um, uh, populous or biggest cities, that is Accra and Kumase, uh, due to the, the floods and also other, other, other related issues. Um, now, and um, Ghana is also considered to be a, a chronic or maybe coastal erosion chronic. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and, and in fact, the sea level induced uh, disasters are, are, are actually. Um, on, on the rise. Now it's estimated that our 2.7 million um, square meters of, um, of, of area or land area of our shoreline is actually eroded. And this actually makes about 1.8 million people exposed um, to, to the hazard. But unfortunately, uh, Ghana lacks um, the disaster prevention and response uh, and also recovery mechanism to actually deal with uh, natural and man-made and also human-induced disasters. Um, some interventions actually uh, have been implemented in the past and, and notably among them is a, a collaborative effort between the Ghana government of Ghana and the World Bank uh, to actually develop a, a disaster management plan for Ghana. Also um, around 2004, in 2014, a capacity building uh, program was also developed again, uh, by uh, United Nations uh, Development Program and also the NADMO, which is uh, the National Disaster Management Organization. Yeah, though this um, uh, interventions um, uh, improve the human capacity. Um, we believe that uh, the lack in uh, ap application of uh, geospatial um, technology uh, actually is, is, is not actually um, improving the system. Yeah, so we believe that when we actually include geospatial information to, 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 to disaster management, we can uh, effectively um, uh, improve our services. Therefore, our, our uh, uh, PAD research uh, is aimed to explore um, data-driven uh, geospatial approach yeah, to, help, to help build a decision to, to a decision-making make, process uh, in building resilience that's in, in Ghana. Uh, for the purpose of, of um, this presentation, um, the objective um, are to uh, identify the, the driving forces in the shoreline um, changes, and also to also evaluate the relationship between the, the, the forces of the change. Now, to be able to understand, um, th this um, is the coast of Ghana. Um, it's estimated that 25% of uh, the population in, in Ghana, population of Ghana, resides along the coast. Um, the, the top 10 larger cities in, in Ghana and even the, the popular cities are also located along, along the coast. And um, the, coastal, the coastal line actually is divided into uh, three geomorphological zones. Um, we have the, the, the west coast, 
And the West Coast um, span a distance of 95 uh, kilometers, which uh, actually is characterized by fine and sandy beaches and some coastal lagoons. Then we also have the, the central um, Okay, so we also have we also have the central the central parts, which which also um, yeah the central parts, which which is also the longest, which span a distance of three hundred and twenty one kilometers, and it's mostly ca characterized by um, rocky shores and also some sand barriers, and we have the eastern coast, which which uh, also span one hundred and forty nine kilo kilometers and which is mostly uh, lagoons, uh, sandy beaches, and also the um, Volta River uh, Delta. Okay. Now, this uh, is a, a map showing the severity of erosion uh, within the, the, the coast of Ghana. Um, from, from, from the map, we can actually see that um, the eastern coastal geomorphology is actually eroding faster. Yes, it's um, the eastern, and, and actually that, that's the focus of, or that's going to be the, my, my, my research area, yeah. Now, um, I just want to bring some images to, to, to actually uh, illustrate how serious our shorelines are, are actually uh, eroding. Um, this is a uh, Google Earth imagery of uh, one area called the Angola Beach, which is actually the western region of Ghana. Um, we actually visited this place for a program based um, trip. Now, <clears throat> I, I just want us to, to see where, where the, the pin, yeah, where we have uh, decommissioned well. In actual, by 2014, that well was actually uh, in the community, in with the community also that has been used to supply water to the community. Yeah. And um, yeah, this is actually the well. Now, the, the, the picture on our uh, that, that's one on our right shows the position of the wall currently to, to 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 the shoreline. Yeah, but in 2014, we realized that it's it was inside the community which uh, supplies water to the community. But in 2021, when we visited our site, we realized that uh, it uh, it is now very close to to the to the shoreline. Uh, we can just see uh, where we have the decommissioned well. Yeah. So the image for 2020 actually gives us a vivid um, uh, illustration on uh, where the well currently is. Yeah, so I think that, that this is a, a picture that tells us um, how, how our shorelines are eroding. Now there's also one, um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, in fact, this uh, also uh, one uh, image of a shoreline eroding. Um, this is a map of the river, and the map of the river actually uh, enters the sea uh, in 2014. Um, you can see at, 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 at your, uh, the left corner, down left corner, but in 2020, all those places are eroded and it's now closer to the community of Ang Angola Beach. Yes, um, this is a picture just to illustrate. Uh, and also we, 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 we also have sand, sand dunes, um, villages or houses being swallowed by, by sand. Yeah, and also actually um, moving the community uphill. Now, this is a picture of uh, Fuveme, uh, a community along the, the 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 eastern coast. In fact, um, in 2016, um, actually intimated that uh, this community gradually is 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 is, get, is converting into an island 
because of the the the, the coastal um, erosion and also the storms. And um, just yesterday, I heard this. I have had this picture from a friend who who also who is also doing a work around the same area. This is the same place, the Fubeme area, um, influx of seawater into the communities. Yes, people woke up in the morning and um, they, 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 they actually um, had water on their, camp, uh, on their compound. So this is how serious the sea level rises are. Now, governments um, to keep the situation uh, currently is building a lot of um, sea defense wall as a way of mitigating um, uh, this uh, uh, hazard. Uh, but uh, uh, a lot of thoughts have not gone into it. Still, researches are going on. There are some researches that seem to suggest that um, these sea defense walls are also exacerbating some of the erosions at other ends of, of the um, other coast, which in other fact for the Vota uh, River Basin or the Vota Delta, yes, um, Ado, uh, Pioneer Ado um, uh, noted that uh, uh, this sea defense wall, which is along the Kita stretch, is actually increasing the erosion along the, the, the eastern part of um, the Delta and also into Togo, yes, because complaints have been but in that Togo is complaining that the activities of this sea defense war is actually uh, uh, increasing the sea erosion in Togo and other places. Now, this an imagery of uh, the Vota Delta. Now, Vota Delta, just as any um, uh, Delta, is very dynamic so, and highly vulnerable. Mr. Chum, you have about two minutes. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, vulnerable to um, CC level rises. And um, <clears throat> when we realize that the um, significant wavelength or significant uh, ocean wave um, is also have an impact on um, the, the, the shoreline and also the tidal, um, uh, the tidal ranges yes, per, per, per the literature has no effect on, 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 on the shore. In fact, <clears throat> um, the Managing coast, coastal risks um, actually is of an interest. And um, a, a lot of people have um, tried to work around it and they've realized that um, to be able to effectively manage it, uh, it deals with cost and also the computational power of, of the system. Unfortunately, most of the early warning systems and decision support systems um, actually have technical issues and also computational issues. Issue and then also you need like in in our developing world like as we actually lack or there's something that there's a data gap so uh, we, we are trying to see how best we can use um, Bayesian network to be able to um, 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 assess this this risks. Um, the the previous speaker has spoken at length about Bayesian, so we are not going to delve more about it. But basically, what, what we did was that we used the junior academic version. Um, we identify three variables um, to be able to build our 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 um, uh, network. We classify them as low, moderate, and high risks, and the shoreline changes as um, uh, erosion and accretion. Um, basically, this is the the model that we've constructed. We are still at the initial stages of the the research. Yes, um, but interestingly enough, uh, with the sensitivity analysis. We realize that sea level rises and also uh, wave heights are very critical based on the survey and also the experts uh, we consulted to build the, the model. So in fact, this has given us some idea on what to do uh, uh, going forward. Um, so in fact, th this is what we'll be doing going, going, going forward. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Mr. Chum. To present um, and, uh, so. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chum. That was a really insightful presentation about what is happening in Ghana and how you are using the Bayesian model to address uh, that issue. Uh, on this note, this is actually the last presentation for the day. And I want to thank everybody uh, for the wonderful presentations that we've had so far. 
I will hand over to Adolf. Um, so Adolf will give us the closing remark, and I think that will be all for uh, the second Capital Conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mawuli. And again, thank you to all the speakers and also all the discussants. Again, excellent presentation. And I, and I think um, I will try to summarize on these three days that uh, we really have really good speakers giving uh, very imp uh, addressing important topics. And I hope that uh, all of you will be able to gain some insights uh, on the theme of the conference for this year is the adaptation and resilience of transport and logistics in the post pandemic world. Uh, we are still facing the challenges um, from COVID-19 and also from, of course, from uh, climate change and resilience issues. And I believe that um, finally, we, I am confident that we will be able to develop effective solutions to deal with this problem and actually make our transport and logistic facilities more resilient in the future. So um, I think before I end, um, I would just want to very quickly again address um, the support from our sponsors and supporters to this conference. That, uh, and we genuinely appreciate the support, which include the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, VTC China, the Genesis Project, University of Manitoba, Hong Kong Community College of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, Institute of Sea Transport, Catch Business School, the University of Bologna, and the Beijing Normal University, Hong Kong Baptist University, United International College. So with this, um, I would like to uh, declare that um, the, uh, the second cap tier conference has come to a close. And I hopefully we will be able to see you again in the third cap tier conference in the foreseeable future. And of course, hopefully at that time, it will be a physical conference that will be able to interact face to face again uh, with the pandemic uh, behind us. And finally, and last but not least, once again, thank you very much, uh, everyone. And I hope that all of you will have a great summer. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.